Good morning. Thanks for braving the cold to be here. Um, as Chris said, I've been here for a long, I've actually been here for over 15 years now. And it's what, it wasn't the Broad when I got here. And I came in from uh, particle physics. So I just started doing whatever, whatever came to hand. And one of the things that came to hand was working on natural selection, partly because Party Sabetti was, was getting involved after a couple of years and she was working heavily in that area. And it was just a, it seemed like a cool thing to work on. So I, I worked with her some of the time and sometime independently. And I've done lots of other things too. And right now actually human uh, natural selection isn't our, my biggest focus, but I still am involved in it. Today I'm talking about natural selection and its effect on human genetic variation and that means I'm basically talking about very recent selection, selection within about the last 50,000 years, say, um, which is actually still a very interesting subject. It's not how we got to be humans, but it is um, a lot of things have happened to humans in the last 50,000 years. We moved into most of the planet, different climates, different uh, di big changes to diet, uh, infectious disease has changed a lot in that time. So there have been all sorts of different selective pressures going on. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what natural selection does to genetic variation and how we can detect it and, and some of the things we can learn from it. All right, so to start with just a simple definition, um, you all know what natural selection is. It's the, it's the driver of adaptive evolution. Um, and it's just the idea that if you have a particular allele or a genotype that makes you more likely um, to survive and to um, reproduce, then that allele is going to be, it's going to tend to increase in frequency in the population and spread. Um, and it's convenient to break down natural selection into several different types. Um, and one of the first one is balancing selection. It's probably the rarest of them. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It it's, maintains multiple different alleles in the population um, for long periods of time. Much the most common kind is purifying selection, uh, which is selection against new mutations that are deleterious, that are bad for the organism. And that's the most common because most genes, most parts of the genome that do anything are pretty well adapted already. They, they function well, and if you change them, they're probably gonna, it's probably a change for the worse. The really interesting stuff is usually considered in the in positive selection, a selection for a new trait. And that's what we really think of as classical Darwinian um, adaptation. You've got a new challenge, you've moved to a new environment, how, do you, how does your the species change to um, adapt to that? And that's positive selection. So it's for a new trait. Um, so I'll describe each of these a little bit briefly. Uh, balancing selection first. And I'll just give you an example of it, which is the sickle cell trait. This is the maybe the most familiar example of natural selection in humans. It's the one that's been understood for the longest. Uh, and it is a case of balancing selection. Um, and in fact, it was, it was the first discovered, Haldane noticed uh, in the 40s that if you looked at the distribution of malaria in the world and the distribution of certain blood diseases, including um, sickle cell anemia, there was a strong correlation between where malaria was common and where um, these diseases were. And in this case, uh, on the top I show up, there's a map of an estimate of what malaria uh, where malaria was intense, this was around 1900. It's changed a lot since then. Europe doesn't have a lot of malaria now. Um, and on the bottom is the distribution of the sickle cell mutation um, in Africa. And um, you can see, if you can see the scale, it goes up from up to sometimes over 15% in some regions within Central Africa. And whereas in most of the world, it's completely missing. And uh, this is pretty well understood now. We realize this is a single mutation uh, that's occurred multiple times, but uh, in, in multiple places. But there's a single mutation that changes one amino acid, and as a result, the result is that this is a mutation in the uh, hemoglobin B gene. And as a result, the hemoglobin, um, as a result, the red blood cells can no longer be invaded, or it's very difficult for malaria parasites to invade the red blood cells. So it, it can, having a copy of this gene. Um, gives you a lot of protection against uh, malaria, specifically falciparum malaria. Um, however, if you have two copies of the genes, you get the bottom state. Um, if you see the pictures on, over there, uh, this is a normal red blood cell. And these are sickled red blood cells. Uh, if you have two copies, then hemoglobin starts to polymerize and you get these long strings of hemoglo hemoglobin polymers and then you get stretched out red blood cells, which is quite bad for health and you have sickle cell anemia. And people have done studies showing, uh, comparing survival 
uh, in an African setting um, for the, the three different genotypes, uh, the two homozygotes and the, and the heterozygote. And you can see on top, those in this, in, the, in this environment where malaria is intense, um, those who have, those who are heterozygotes um, have the best survival. And those who are wild type, who have no protection, um, sub, um, they tend, a lot of them do die from malaria, but they survive much better than people who have two copies of the, um, uh, the sickle cell trait and have sickle cell anemia. So one, I mean, if this is an interesting case, it's well known. Um, one interesting thing about it, just to note, is that natural selection can vary a lot with environment and can vary, vary where you are, what uh, diseases you're exposed to, what environment, your, what your particular environment happens to look like. So in North America, having uh, sickle cell, the sickle cell mutation is clearly just deleterious. In Africa, it's, uh, it, it's not deleterious, um, at least to have one copy. The other point to note is that evolution and natural selection can be kind of brutal. Um, where the <laughs> mutation is common, um, it's, up to, it's up to 15 or 16 percent. As many as two or three percent of births have uh, or potentially have sickle cell anemia, and so the the cost is, is quite high. This kind of uh, particular case of balancing selection is known as heterozygote advantage for the obvious reason that the heterozygote has an advantage; they're better. Um, there are other ways of having a balancing selection. There can, for instance, there, you can have selection for diversity so that you want to be different from everybody else in your neighborhood. Um, there are various reasons for that. One is uh, predators. Some predators will just preferentially prey on the most common prey. The birds will eat the most common moth color, whatever it happens to be. And if you have a different moth, a different color, if you're a moth and you have a different color, then you're in, in better shape. Um, and similarly, uh, for resistance to disease, if everyone in your town has a particular, susceptible to a particular disease and you're susceptible to some other disease, then you're in pretty good shape because everyone around you is going to get sick. That, that they're the ones who are going to expose you to disease and you are now uh, protected. And so in immune, in immune genes, you uh, will sometimes see balancing selection for diversity. And the, the big example of this is the HLA region, uh, human leukocyte antigen region on chromosome 6, which is very important in uh, immunity. And different um, particular genotypes or combinations of genotypes make you susceptible and resistant to different diseases. And if you look at data, uh, this is data from the this 1000 Genomes pilot project, um, look across chromosome 6, and let's look how dense uh, SNPs are. You'll find a, there's one region uh, early in the chromosome where that has many more SNPs than elsewhere. And the, this is, of course, the HLA region. And this is, this is an example of a slightly different kind of selection called frequency-dependent selection. So what this, whether it's a particular variant is good or bad depends on what other people have, not just on what your, uh, you know, what your physical environment is. It depends on what your neighbors have. And in this case, it, it serves to keep these various alleles in the population, sometimes for a very long time. Some of these variants are shared back to chimpanzee and even earlier uh, orangutan. Um, as a side note, um, while we have evolved to respond to pathogens in that way, pathogens, of course, evolve as well and do the same thing, and they do it faster. This is a plot of diverse, uh, genetic diversity on a, a chromosome in malaria, a um, plasmodium falciparum. And there are, if you look, at, look across these chromosomes in malaria, you will see these giant spikes, uh, like this one in the middle. Oops, sorry, that's not a pointer. There, that's a pointer, like this one here. And these occur at genes that are exposed to the human immune system. Malaria normally hides inside red blood cells, but it exports certain proteins to the, uh, the cell membrane. And those proteins are then exposed to the immune system, so there's a lot of pressure to have diversity. There's diversity between parasites. There's, in some cases, there are multiple copies of these genes within the parasite, and they turn them on successively, um, and each one's different. So there's a lot of pressure to have a lot of diversity. So we've had a lot of impact on that organism, even as they've had a lot of impact on us. All right, turning now to purifying selection. I said this is the most common in some ways the least interesting, um, for, for some of us at least, at least for population genetics. Um, and it's the elimination of new deleterious alleles. And you can see this all over the genome. 
this is thousand genomes data again. Uh, on the top here, this is plotted, this is diversity. Um, and they plotted for a bunch of different genes in the genome. They've broken it down into exons. The exons are indicated by arrows and introns and the, the, you know, the UTRs. And you can see there's just less diversity um, within the exons simply because if you get a mutation in an exon, a coding exon, there's a good chance it's non-synonymous or nonsense. Most of those are bad. Um, and so they get el rapidly eliminated from the population or fairly rapidly. So you see this all over. It's um, common. It's medically important because some of these are disease um, uh, mutations. These are, some of them are uh, disease causing. They could cause severe disease. They can raise your risk of common diseases. Um, and so a lot of what the medical, uh, you know, GWAS and all those things, a lot of them are actually dealing with, with the mutations that are occurring right, right in here. Uh, not everything is medically relevant because some of those mildly deleterious alleles may just make you less attractive, um, a little bit slower or whatever, um, which doesn't rise to the level of being a health problem, but uh, may still cost you your ability to, your, your likelihood of reproducing. Um, <laughs> I'm not making any comments about him, you know, but um, the, the, yeah, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. What is, when you're dividing by the divergence, ah. what is that and why does that look? Why is that, what this is showing, so, here, this is comparing divergence to an out species. I forget, it might be macaque. And what this is showing is that just as many of these mutations are lost from, you know, in the long term evolution in, um, as there are missing in every day. So these are the actual, the reason for doing this is to see whether it's the actual uh, variant themselves that are being selected against, which is the case here, um, as opposed to a selective sweep where one variant is causal and you wipe out a whole lot of diversity around it, that, that, wouldn't, that does not affect, um, the selective sweeps does not affect um, the divergence from another species. So that, that's why that was there. Can you address a related? <laughs> and, and I didn't repeat is, the question. Which is um, <laughs> genetic variation within the species and whether it's carried forward in evolution to uh, to other species. So for example, how often you mentioned that the mm -hmm. HLA has uh, genetic variation that's found both within chimps and within humans. Right. How unusual is that? Uh, or how much of genetic variation in humans is actually found in closely related? Right, so how, how much genetic variation has been carried over, that's currently seen in humans, has been carried over from other species? Uh, and the answer is very little. Uh, that's why it's notable that, that these have been seen in the HLA because it's um, the typical time depth to um, the, the typical age of variance in humans is on the, like 800,000 years or a million years. And the time since the divergence from chimpanzees is more like f five to seven million years. And there's just very little variation that has survived um, that would be seen in both, that, that would still be seen as variable in both species. Um, so it, it happens, but it's, it's quite uncommon. Um, not all of these deleterious mutations are eliminated immediately. Obviously, if, if you have a lethal mutation, you are not, it, that, that mutation is not going to be seen in the population. But a mildly deleterious allele can persist for quite a long time. It will not rise to very high frequency, um, generally. But you can, if you look at rarish alleles, these are actually quite rare alleles. I think this is from HapMap data. Um, here I'm comparing uh, non-synonymous mutations with synonymous mutations. Most synonymous mutations are neutral. And you see there's this excess of really rare um, non-synonymous mutations. So this is presumably, um, these are deleterious alleles that are being carried by individuals in the population. We all have some. Um, and uh, they just are hanging around at low frequency. You can even see that within non-synonymous mutations, um, if you break it down further, um, the red and the orange here are, are non-synonymous mutations that are thought to be probably, probably to affect the function of the, the protein that's uh, produced. Um, whereas uh, the green bar is probably benign. It's, it's like not, not crucial to the uh, protein function. And you can see that there's a great, greater, much greater enhancement of uh, low frequency mutations among the, the probably damaging uh, variants. So this again is these are the these are the disease causing mutations a lot of them. 
So that's, that, that's the effect directly on the mutations that are deleterious. There's also an effect uh, called uh, background selection, which happens around genes and around other functional elements. Um, there's an additional effect on variation. And because uh, a gene, say, will repeatedly suffer mutations, deleterious mutations, and those mutations keep getting washed out by natural selection, there's actually a loss of diversity around these functional elements. Um, and it's, uh, it's considered a good approximation. It's very similar to having a small, smaller population there because you keep losing chromosomes. There's a certain number of chromosomes in the population, but some of them are carrying uh, deleterious mutations, and so they're just going to be washed out. And so smaller populations have less diversity. And so around genes, this is, oops, I did it again. Um, you can see that there's this dip in diversity. Uh, these are the, the three uh, populations, African, European, and, and Asian. Um, and you will characteristically see this near genes. Um, that's all I'm going to say about purifying selection. Turning to positive selection, this is where most of the interest is. Um, and it's sort of what, what makes us human, you know, what, what has changed us, what makes groups of people different from one another. Um, and it's the, the mo I find it the most interesting, but the, one of the issues with it is we don't really know how much of it there's been. We know there's been some, obviously, adaptation has happened, but we're not entirely sure how much. So I'll look a little bit more detail in positive selection at what we expect to see uh, when it has happened in the genome so we can have some idea of how to find it. Um, so let's say we start with a population, these gray guys on the left, um, and a mutation happens. Well, let's, let's say this is a mutation that is not beneficial. It's just a neutral mutation. doesn't make any difference. And as time goes on, well, the, the frequency can go up and go, go down. Uh, eventually, it might rise to fixation. Uh, more likely, it's just going to disappear eventually. It's, it's random. This is, this is genetic drift. Um, when uh, there is positive selection, you start with the same kind of mutation, time goes on, it tends to increase in frequency because it's beneficial. And so um, the main difference between the, with the, other, the previous case is that this will rise to frequency much faster. The other one might get to fixation, but it'll take a long time typically. You, this, this, mean, this happens very quickly. And this, so you can see the, the prevalence in the population of that allele then rises fast. And based on that of simple fact, there are a number of signals that are left in, behind in genetic variation when this happens. Um, and if we start, we, we have some, some chromosome somewhere, um, and the, if the initial population in which this red beneficial mutation happens, there's a lot of diversity around it and a lot of different uh, variation. Afterwards, um, after the selection has occurred or while it's occurring, you will have a lot of chromosomes in the population that look very similar right around that mutation because as it rises in frequency, it takes a chunk of the, the chromosome with it. And how big the chunk is depends on how much recombination has happened. And so uh, the first signal of, of that selection has happened there, this is called a selective sweep. It's not that it brings a piece of the, of the chromosome with it. Uh, the first signal is that there is not much diversity there. You can see that there's everybody looks pretty similar in this in this particular population at this point in the genome. Um, I, one difficulty is that, as I just said, lower diversity near a gene is also a sign of background selection, of purifying selection. So this isn't necessarily a very easy, uh, helpful way of distinguishing positive selection from the selection you expect to have already be happening near a gene. But it does happen. That is an important one. Um, more relevant are. Um, other tests that we can do. One test is to look for high differentiation between populations. I suppose this selection has happened in um, Western Europe. Then you expect the allele frequencies in this region to be very different from allele frequencies elsewhere in the world um, because this is the only place this has been driven up to high, high, um, high frequency. And one common measure of this diff kind of differentiation is uh, FST, which is a, just a measure of how different allele frequencies are. FST is equal to one if the, uh, if the two alleles are fixed in the two populations for opposite alleles. Uh, and it's zero if they are the identical frequencies. A um, couple examples of that, of, of cases of selection you can detect by this um, high differentiation. One is another malaria case. This is, uh, involves Vivax malaria, a different uh, uh, parasite. Uh, 
And there is a mutation in the, the Duffy blood uh, antigen um, that renders it null, it, 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 it uh, destroys production of the protein. Um, and it's at very high frequency within parts of sub-Saharan Africa, actually at 100% within sub-Saharan Africa in some regions, and at 0% in most of the world, which is quite unusual in the human genome. And we, again, we know, now know why this is the case. The Duffy blood antigen sits on the, as the name suggests, it sits on the red blood cells, and it is the only means by which uh, Vivex malaria parasites enter red blood cells, which is critical for their life cycle. And so if you don't have um, a copy of Duffy, then the parasites can't get in, you don't get Vivax malaria, and as a result, there is almost no Vivax malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, and that, this is, I don't remember what year this was, but this was, has been known for, for some time now. A more, somewhat more recent example, um, people have been looking for adaptation to high altitude, looking especially in Tibet, but also in the Andes and in Ethiopia, where there are highlands. And this is an example of one of those studies. Um, in this case, this study is showing uh, the allele frequency in a Tibetan population along the x-axis and in the, the frequency of the same alleles in a Han Chinese population on the y-axis. And these are very closely related populations. The frequencies tend to be very similar in the two populations. But if you look down here, there are two variants that have much higher frequency in Tibet than uh, in the, the Han. Um, and they're both in the same gene, this EPOS1, which it turns out is a key regulator of hemoglobin and we now know is responsible for a bit particular phenotype within, that's part of the adaptation uh, to high altitude. It actually lowers the, the, the sort of the baseline hemoglobin density um, in uh, Tibetans. Um, and so this is a glaring example. You can, you can see it. You don't need any sophisticated tests. You just look at this plot and you can see what's, what's going on. This oh, does, oh, it actually, yes, the, the, yes. It's and this adaptation, it is, and. Parasite doses mm -hmm. really bad if you have hypoxic stimulation. Right. So, if you have a very high red blood cell count. Then yes, so sure. lack of, uh, yes. Right, it's low oxygen and produces, you tend, to, you tend to produce more red blood cells and you can you have, then have an excess if you have uh, um, lower, if you have the normal level of hemoglobin. That this, this, so this adaptation is clearly present in Tibet. Different adaptations are present in um, the Andes. So this particular one is not there. Um, yes? Um, I, Actually, don't remember. I believe this is seen again in Africa. I don't remember if it's the, if the same adapt, adaptation is seen in, in the Andes or not. I had to look. Sorry. Um, what was I going to say? I don't remember. Um, oh, yeah. This one thing this illustrates is that there is power in looking at closely related populations because if there's been um, a selective pressure that's a, confined to one of them, it can really stand out, um, and uh, as, as it does here. But there, it turns out there aren't too many of these glaring cases. Uh, in another similar study, they plotted the, the genome-wide FST, so how different the populations are for a whole bunch of populations. I think mean, this was 26 populations. They compared every pair of populations. Um, and compared, and then, then they plotted in the, on the y-axis the maximum FST for any particular SNP. So this is the most diverged SNPs. And it turns out that the most diverged SNPs tend to follow very closely the whole population. So most of the um, differences between populations are driven by just the overall genetic relatedness. And you do see these outliers. Uh, this one I was just talking about is here. There are several other, a couple of others that are real, real outliers. These are both um, pigmentation genes. So there's strong pressure to have different pigmentation, as you've probably noticed if you've ever looked at people. Um, and uh, there are maybe, perhaps as many as a couple dozen genes uh, involved in that process. So a, a couple of them stand out by this kind of measure. But one of the things about humans is we've only very recently expanded to these different populations. And so natural sele selection occasionally produces big differences, but mostly it just produces fairly small changes on the baseline differences driven by our, our, our sort of overall pattern of dispersal. Which makes it a little bit harder to find natural selection, unfortunately. All right, so that was the first uh, test, the first signal. Second one is um, that you see these long haplotypes. 
Um, because this region has risen rapidly, it hasn't broken down by recombination. So if you look at one allele, you'll find it's correlated with a lot of other alleles nearby because they were all started as a single chromosome. And there are several different tests that have been, uh, statistical tests that have been developed to look for this. Um, it's actually a very uh, effective way of finding cases of natural selection. Um, the earliest application of it, of some, some kind of test like this, um, was in uh, discovering lactase persistence or lactose tolerance, which was first applied in Europe. Um, and it had long been noted that people whose ancestors started raising cattle um, could digest lactose and were lactose tolerant, whereas most people in the world aren't. And it was discovered that there was this enormously long um, unbroken haplotype. This shows how, how, that, how the haplotype continues over space. This is like a, a megabase long or longer. Uh, and in Europe, there's this long haplotype right around uh, the lactase gene, which is kind of suggestive. Lactase is what breaks down lactose. Um, and that's what you don't have if you are lactose intolerant as an adult. Um, and compared to, say, an Afri common African haplotype, West African haplotype, which breaks down very rapidly because of recombination. And so this was a strong, uh, very strong evidence that there had been strong selection for the ability to digest uh, <coughs> lactose, basically for lactase to persist into adulthood. Normally you have, you, you're, you produce lactase in your dig digestive system when you're an infant because you're drinking milk, and most mammals stop drinking milk when, after weaning, and um, so they turn off the production. There was this mutation. So a lot of Europeans and certain East Africans, some uh, South Asians, different groups around the world that raised cattle or goats or whatever um, have this mutation and, um, and therefore have this strong signal of selection. Um, if you look in across the entire genome, this, is, this shows how long a haplotype is and how common it is. So strongly selected things should be up here in the corner. The strongest signal selection in Western Europe, this is the, the Ceph uh, panel, uh, was at lactase. So that, this, is the, this is the positive control. If you have some test for selection and you don't find lactase, you're doing it wrong. Uh, all right, so there's a third test I won't say much about, which is that you expect to see um, an excess of high-frequency derived alleles. These are the newer mutations that aren't the ancestral state. Typically, derived alleles are at low frequency on average in the, in, in the population. But if you have some derived alleles sitting on this initial chromosome, they'll be raised to high frequency along with the others. And so that's an additional test and provides some additional information. Um, I looked back at my computer and I discovered I gave a primer on natural selection in 2007 um, here. And at the time, this was, this was hot stuff because we, had, we, we were in the genomic era now. And this was you know, breaking you know, news. We had complete genomes from various uh, species, including us. We had big databases of lots of SNPs in it, although small compared to now. And we had big data, you know, HapMap was, was coming out. And we, so we could now look across the entire genome and see where in the genome um, natural selection had happened, positive selection had occurred. Um, and this was sort of the peak years of like 2004 to 2008. So at the time it was exciting news, now it's a history lesson, um, <laughs> which only makes me feel a little old, but that's okay. Um, and so what happened was it, it sort of, it worked. We did genome scans. Uh, it was a kind of a gold rush. A bunch of people did. Everybody had their favorite signal for natural selection, um, their favorite test for that signal. They looked at the, some data set and they found a whole bunch of places in the genome, the little gray, gray blots there, um, indicating that selection, had, positive selection had probably happened there. Um, and we started looking at them and some, well, some we already knew. We knew about hemoglobin, malaria. Um, some of them were new, like this high altitude adaptation I said, uh, lactase, a um, bunch of pigmentation genes. So there's a bunch of new things that were found, uh, low hanging fruit, and it was, everything was good. Um, the difficulty was that there were all these other things, hundreds of them, hundreds of places, and nobody knew what they did. Um, and then people kind of, a lot of people lost interest and moved on because it, it turned out to be hard. So the results of the genome scans were big lists of, lo of candidate loci. But when you compared the lists from different methods, there wasn't a lot of overlap 
So there are some unknown amount of false positives. You know, sometimes they were just looking for different things, but there's probably false positives in there. We're not sure which, how many of these exactly are actually positive selection. Some of them clearly are. Um, and each set of uh, loci, they're actually there are sets of kind of large regions because these are selective sweeps, so they happen over a big region. Um, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of variants within a single region, multiple genes. Uh, it's not clear what you can say about it. And of course, we have no idea what the function was, what, what caused the natural selection, what the selective pressure was. Um, and that made it difficult to do much with. So it was exciting. We found a bunch of stuff, and then uh, some people lost interest. Um, but not everyone did. And so what you have to do is then do smarter things. And there are various ways of doing that. And um, we are, I'll give, there's one example um, and in which the idea is to combine, provide, take, use more information to try to learn more from a scan. So in this case, this is a, a paper from Hunter Fraser I'm focusing on here. Um, you focused on likely functional variants only. So uh, th this way you're much more likely to be finding the functional cases, like non-synonymous SNPs and uh, uh, EQTLs that affect the expression level of genes. And you grouped variants by function so that you're not looking at just one uh, variant, uh, but group genes by, you know, like, uh, it can be no, in a known pathway, it could be like skin EQTLs, some, something that, that's likely to move together. And then he correlated uh, the frequency of a bunch of these different alleles uh, with some with the environment. In his case, he looked at geography variables and at climate variables. Some other people have looked at pathogen density and other things. And the idea is to see which alleles consistently move as you like are in colder climates or in exposure to more sunlight or exposure to more pathogens. Um, this is a little diagram of, of the, the basic idea. You, you take these variables, you correlate it with allele frequencies in a bunch of populations, and you end up with some number of candidates which for places where adapt or, or kinds of adaptation that have happened either in regulatory or in or non synonymous mutations and you get some he got some nice results um, the strongest result I think was showing that um, genes that respond to UV damage uh, skin damage um, not too surprisingly perhaps are um, more expressed near the equator and that that is you're genetically more prone to express these genes when you're near the equator and less, and they're downregulated as you get further away. This is at latitude for distance from the equator. Uh, the different colors are different populations and each one is a, a particular population, I think. So collectively, um, UV damage is controlled genetically and the degree of it is, is, uh, has been the result of selection. Uh, Joel Hershorn here did something a little bit similar looking at uh, selection for height in Europe, showing that there are a whole bunch of uh, different alleles that uh, tend towards taller stature um, or more common in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe as is Klein. So this is suggestive that there was selection uh, for greater height in Northern Europe. Um, so that's, that was one approach. Uh, in Pardi Sabeti's lab, which is where I, I work these days, uh, we took a somewhat different approach, um, also trying to do a smarter scan. And her idea was to combine information not only from outside sources, but from the different signals, because there are all these different signals, and people have basically been doing scans using one of the signals, like looking at a long haplotype. Um, but they actually have considerable amount of different information in them, in these signals. So if you combine them, you can get a better signal for where selection happened and try to address the problem of these large regions where you don't really know what, what's functional and what wasn't, what isn't in the function. Try to narrow in, zero in on what was actually selected for. Um, and, uh, well, I might as well talk about it. This is uh, simulated data. The red distributions are what you expect from uh, the actual causal SNP, the one that's driving the selection. And the blue distributions are from what the neutral neighbors will look like. And these, for these are for three of these different signals of selection. Uh, long haplotypes, highly differentiated between populations, and uh, high frequency derived alleles. And you can combine them and the result is you get better separation between, uh, not still not spectacular, it's not perfect, but you get substantially better separation between um, the, uh, the actual causal SNP and other variants nearby. And 
we've applied that to data and it actually works surprisingly well. This is, uh, this is a region that has, shows sign of selection based on a long haplotype. And it's, there are several genes in the region. And it's really very hard just looking at these signals to pick out where exactly in here did the selection likely happen. Turns out when you combine all of these, you get this plot on the bottom, the score on the bottom, you get this very nice, um, sp sort of spectacularly nice indication that this, there's this one variant that looks really um, promising. It happens to be a non-synonymous change. It happens to be in a skin pigmentation gene. Um, and is in fact, this is one of the genes that is, is related to, to uh, selection for skin pigmentation. This was, uh, could be known independently, um, but it's a, um, indication of how well the system can work. It does not always work that way. More commonly you get, still get 10 or 50 or 100 possible variants rather than uh, one or two, but it's still much better than having thousands. And the other thing is it focuses it on one gene, which gives you a much better clue as to what's going on. If you, if you have hand, half a dozen different genes, you're not really sure what's happening. So when you apply this to the whole genome, well, if you look at um, the, those pigmentation genes I mentioned, yeah, you, you find very good uh, 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 agreement that they tend to lie, you know, the problem, the selection appears to have happened right in the gene or very nearby, often it's regulatory changes nearby genes. Um, but that's not very interesting because we already know about these. Um, but it's more interesting when you apply them to unknown regions. This is the result of just a scan for um, long haplotypes, and these are the kind of signals we were seeing. We chose these as regions that looked like they had selection. You combine the signals and suddenly everything looks much better, and now you have real candidates to look at um, in detail. And um, then it starts getting a little bit harder because you still have to figure out what do these things do? And why, why were they selected? Because that's what we want to know. We don't want to know that selection happened on some chromosome. We want to know what happened biologically. And so the, the process then is to go from this genome scan to a particular hypothesis of, of adaptation. First thing to do is to find, is to find map the variants that, that we've just done. Then you add a lot of annotations. What's functional in here? What's a conserved regulatory element? Those annotations have been improving dramatically. We have a very much better idea now than we did a few years ago of what's functional. Um, and so that when you apply that, like this is one case uh, in near the gene TLR5, toll-like receptor 5. Um, well, we find mapped it to this region. We can, uh, you know, functionally annotate that one of these is a non-synonymous change. That non-synonymous change happen is highly, I mean, that site is highly conserved. It happens to sit in the binding pocket for this protein. It you know, suggests this might be well be functional. Um, and so that means you can then, then go on and start doing real biology of say, all right, this is a candidate for something that's doing something. It's in a toll-like receptor. It probably has to do with innate immunity because that's what toll-like receptors do. And so you can start doing real experiments um, and find out what it is that, that's going on there. Um, then that's the point at which I stop having, stop having anything to do with this because I don't do real biology. Um, so the real biologists come in and they, they start doing things and I nod when they tell me what they're doing. Um, and in this, you know, so you come up with a particular adaptive hypothesis. In this case, the hypothesis is that or, um, the TLR5 responds to bacterial flagellin, a protein in bacteria, flagellated bacteria. Um, and it turns out that the variant form, the one that appears to be selected for, actually um, reduces uh, the immune response, reduces NF kappa uh, B signaling uh, in response to flagellin, which seems it might seem a little bit counterintuitive. On the other hand, some, some, in some cases, the real um, pathology coming from an infectious disease is overreaction of the, of the immune system, over, over inflammatory reaction, and so this. That's not guaranteed that that's what happened, but there are, are it's, a, it's a good hypothesis as to why this might have been selected for in a particular population. This was a West African population. Um, that there was an infect infectious agent um, for which it was beneficial to have a somewhat lower um, uh, NF kappa B response. Um, and we're not sure exactly which infectious agent, but it's a pretty, pretty good bet that it was, uh, it was one of them. Uh, there are several candidates. Much time, a little bit of time left now. Um, a, a second example, I think there's been a talk presented on this in the past couple of years. Uh, this is a gene called EDAR, ectodysplasin 
something, receptor. Uh, chromosome 2, signal of selection, you find map it. Um, it's pretty small. There is, an, again, a non-synonymous mutation. We're focusing on the non-synonymous mutations because they're the easiest uh, to, to work with. Um, and it's sitting in this gene EDAR. And it's been, or it's already known that EDAR has been a focus of selection in other organisms, in stickleback fish. It changes the, the spines, I think. Um, and it's also known that this is a gene that is important in the development of hair and sweat glands and some other features like teeth in, in humans. And so this is a candidate for something was going on involving one of these systems. Um, and this, is, this was a case where the uh, evidence was for selection was in Eastern Asia. We know that a few thousand years ago, we're not sure exactly how, how many thousand years ago, um, this uh, variant was selected for pretty strongly. Um, became very common. E, Yana Kambarov in Pardis's lab um, made a mouse model and did other work on it and showed that, um, in fact, there are significant phenotypic differences between the, the two, uh, the wild type and this variant. Uh, thicker hair, uh, smaller mammary glands, and more sweat glands for uh, uh, the phenotypes we can detect in the mouse. Now, again, we can't actually say. We can't say for sure that it's one of these phenotypes that was selected for, and we can't, also can't say which one. Sweat glands is the sort of might be the strong candidate having to do with you know uh, temperature regulation, but we're focusing down on some real biology here and some biological questions, you know, going from just the genome scan down to, to biology. Um, and there's a lot more stuff out there because there are hundreds of candidate things. Um, Thirty-four of uh, the ones we've looked at. Um, have strong non-synonymous SNP candidates. Uh, another 56 overlap with known EQTLs. Uh, let's see, 165 overlap with GWAS signals for various uh, conditions. And so there's a lot of um, biology and waiting to be teased out. They're now looking at enhancers and, and other regulatory elements. So we overlap with many of those as well. Um, and so we've explored a few of these. Um, uh, I know, well, what we found is a bunch of genes in the in EQTLs, link RNAs, splice sites. There's a lot of biological candidates in there. Um, the ones that people have some clue or some indication that there's connected to possibly to some phenotype include metabolism, things like lactase, um, infectious disease. There are a few associated with the brain, with hearing, like the the many with pigment. Um, some, some, as you just saw, with sweat and with hair development. Um, but there's all, the vast bulk of this has not yet been explored. So there's a lot of material, a lot of places to look, and a lot of good biology to be done there. Yes? Um, so if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you wind up doing a lot of genomes from some uh, population that hasn't currently been mm -hmm. sampled that much, are there tools available to to actually perform this analysis? Are there tools that are able to are perform there, this? Yeah, and, and what like what kind of numbers would you need? Of um, it depends on how how. How, how big a sample do we need and, and are there tools to do it? There are tools to do it in the sense that there is one guy in the lab who can run the tools. Um, and we're currently trying to hire someone who can turn it into a tool that anyone in the lab and in the rest of the world can run. Um, so yes and no, we're getting, getting there, but it would be nice to make this available. I'm not sure, it depends on how strong the selection is and how big the differences are with other populations. We haven't really optimized it I mean, we sort of designed it for the classic hat map populations. You've got you know, three continents and three populations, and you're looking for big differences. We're trying to improve it now so that you can look at multiple populations, more populations than that, populations that had different genetic histories. We've sort of assumed a certain genetic demographic history, um, and particularly populations that are closer related, um, because you want to look at, you want to focus on different things if you're looking at closely related populations. So there's a lot of there's some development going on in this in the um, the computational end to optimize our our efforts. At the same time, there's also um, people in Pertice's lab are also doing a lot of work on, on the functional aspect of how to do the biology. Yes? This is a wonderful lecture, by the way. Oh. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's great. The question I had is, I, you look at haplotype blocks with lactase genes, which yes. are presumably very long. Right. 
And the blocks seem relatively large, and I've always thought that the age is inversely related to the block size. Um, so can you, do I have that concept wrong because the way you calculate how old the mutation is is by the allele block size? Right. Yes. Well, the lactase, I mean, is only a couple, a few thousand years old, a little more than 2,000, but it's only a few thousand years old, which is pretty short in terms of genetic terms. Um, and what initially controls, yeah, what initially controls the size of the haplotype is how fast it happened. Because if it sweeps very fast, there's very little breaking, breakdown while it's occurring. Um, and then afterwards, if there's still other variation in the population, you'll get start to uh, break it down. But if you're looking for positive selection, you're really looking for the smaller ones that have happened over a longer period of time and have great sustaining value, correct? Um, it, it varies. It depends. A, a, a brief burst of really intense selection will give you a really big one. A longer term one will give you a small one. And we're happy to look for either, but it gets harder to look for the short ones, so you're more sensitive to some things. A second question, using mm -hmm. this as a stalking horse for those of us who are looking for mutations in human disease, yeah. uh, there's a certain saturation that's happening with whole exomic sequencing, and the mm -hmm. is very slowing down in certain areas. Everybody's kind of suspicious that the non-coding areas are the next yeah. area. Would you see an enrichment in this in the genes you're seeing as an example of that's a place to work and look for next? I mean, I noticed when you talked about the ones in the non-coding area, they were smaller in number. Is that just that your probes aren't as good, or you haven't? Hey, so, our, 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 yeah. Our, so, are 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 we seeing more cases of selection in in right. coding than in non-coding? I've shown more coding, and the numbers where we know what's going on in non-coding are smaller. There's actually very good evidence that most of the selection has been happening in non-coding. It's been regulatory, probably the great majority of it, um, both from our results, because a lot of our regions actually don't land on any gene, but the bulk of them. Um, that Hunter Fraser paper I showed you with a correlation of geography, that also said uh, one of his conclusions was that the bulk of, of selection has been happening in non-regulatory re regions, which makes a lot of sense because it's a lot easier to fine-tune things um, with regulation rather than actually changing a protein. Um, I'll, I think I'll end with a couple of uh, short um, stories with morals. Um, and the fr this is basically what we can learn from selection. And the first is a kind of an ideal case. And looking at the Duffy locus, uh, we know that the null, Duffy null allele was selected for in sub-Saharan Africa. That helped lead to the um, realization that it was protective against vivax malaria, which in turn helped identify the method, of, the, the means of um, in, invasion of red blood cells for vivax. Um, and that then meant that this uh, gene or this invasion uh, route was a possible candidate for um, vaccines or for uh, drug development. And so this, this is the ideal um, order of things to happen. You look for selection, you find it, you learn some basic biology, um, you, uh, you learn something about that happened in the past. There was a, sele a selection against malaria happening in the past, and you might even get some health benefits out of it eventually. Uh, a somewhat different case is another malaria uh, resistance gene, CD36. It's known that CD36 is involved in malaria um, pathogenesis. It's involved in the sequestration of red blood cells um, within capillaries and within organs, uh, which is important for development of severe malaria. There's a nonsense mutation. Again, that's present only in Africa. It shows signs of having been selected. Um, and, but then when you start looking into the biology, well, there was a whole series of studies saying, well, the selected allele increases the risk. Now, the selected allele decreases the risk. The biggest study, I think this is still the biggest study, uh, was in 2009, showing it had no effect at all um, on severity of malaria. And so this is just a cautionary tale that not everything is simple. Um, there was something going on. It might have been selection for malaria, and the, our genetics have changed. The malaria genetics have changed. Um, we don't or haven't looked at the right thing yet. It might have been selection for something else. Um, this is just one tool. Biology is complicated. Biology is hard. You all know that. But this is you know, one possible tool of, for gaining insight into things and helping tease things out. And it can be very useful sometimes, and sometimes it's still hard. Um, and that's all. Thanks. Maybe one or two more questions. Uh, as folks are filing in for the next session. Question. Yes. Uh, could you uh, just quickly summarize the difference between the positive and purifying 
election signatures then? Sig the, the, well, a signature that's in common is lower diversity. You typically do not find long haplotypes as a result of pur uh, purifying selection because you're selecting against lots of particular lots of new variants, and so the the general picture of uh, diversity of variation in the region doesn't change. You're not picking out one haplotype and en enhancing it. There's not a big increase in um, uh, high frequency derived alleles um, either. And you typically don't find strong differences between populations uh, with purifying selection. Actually, uh, the, the alleles that are under selection will tend to have the same frequency in multiple populations because it's all low. It's being kept at low frequency in purifying selection, and you'll find an increased number of very similar um, FST values. That, okay. Great. Thanks okay. again. All right.